There is nothing worth living for unless it is worth dying for. My grandmother lived a life devoted to Jesus, and today her talks have been made available in their original form. So you too can be built up through the insights and mysteries God revealed to her throughout her ministry. Now, without further ado, here is Elizabeth Elliot. We've been talking about what this week? The Holy Harmony. Thank you. Glad you remembered that. <laughs> Last night we talked about God's ultimate purpose, which is fulfillment. The necessity for us to cooperate in that purpose by trust and obedience and the fact that there will be no holiness without the cross. And then in my second talk, I'm emphasizing the word harmony. I asked the question, do you want the rule of God in your life? I read you a letter from a friend telling about her acceptance of the gift of singleness. And that was the second point. Acceptance is our responsibility. We do have two choices about anything at all that comes into our lives or goes out of our lives. We can either reject it and be angry and resentful at God, or we can align our wills with his will, thus creating a holy harmony, or, uh, and we can accept it or reject it. So you have always the options to choose from. And the third thing in the second talk was living in company with Christ. This morning, we talked about a very dangerous game. And I'm not sure that I mentioned one thing that has contributed to the enormous chaos of the whole dating and sexuality situation in our country. I mentioned a number of things which I think have contributed, one of them being feminism, it's, it's had very serious effects. I don't think we've begun yet to realize how serious and how far-reaching the enormous mistakes of feminism have been, but they are becoming more and more apparent. And another thing is just the lack of understanding of the kind of harmony that God created when he created males and females. Remember, it was God's idea, as Lewis says about the whole subject of sex, it was God's idea, you wouldn't have thought of it. <laughs> and if you had, you would never have been courageous enough to arrange things as God has done with such high risk involved. But it was God's idea, and he meant complementarity, not equality. Men and women are not equal, they are not interchangeable, and the sooner we come to terms with that and accept it, the better, we'll, better off we'll be. Now, if you insist that we're equal, I would say, yes, there are certain ways in which we might legitimately say that we're equal, but they're not really very, it, the word is not very helpful in defining masculinity and femininity. We are equal in being created by God. We are equal in being created in his image. We are equal in being placed under moral responsibility. God's first command, and all three of those equalities are found in the first chapter of Genesis, his first command was be fruitful and multiply. And neither one could have obeyed that without the cooperation of the other. So God's ultimate purpose is harmony in the whole universe. We see harmony in nature as well as disharmony. And the disharmonies, I believe, are the results of the fall. And the same, by the same token, the mess that men and women have been in began at the Garden of Eden where Adam abdicated his God-assigned responsibility to be the initiator, the protector, and the provider. And he got laid back, and he became a wimp, and he decided that if this is what the little woman wants, this is what the little woman can have. And the little woman decided that they would disobey God, and instead of protecting her and digging in his heels and saying, no way, he went along with her. And she became the initiator which she was never meant to be. The roles were reversed, and we've been in a mess ever since. And the more we perpetuate that by women insisting upon equality and becoming the initiators, the more we contribute to 
the chaos and corruption. So what I want to talk about tonight is life bearers. And I believe that all of us, men and women alike, are created to be life bearers. I asked Dr. J.I. Packer when I was about to launch into the writing of my book on masculinity, The Mark of a Man, what do you think of when you think of masculinity? And with no hesitation, he said, responsibility. I read a very interesting secular book, no religious overtones at all, called The Peter Pan Principle. Some of you may have seen that. And it is a sociologist's view of the American male as being highly irresponsible. And they've lost the essence of masculinity. In fact, in an article that I just read, um, it was in Time Magazine's special issue on women. How many of you saw that? Not one person. Oh, one person. Okay. Well, it was dismaying from cover to cover, but one of the quotations in there was from one of the few male writers that had a piece in the magazine, and he said, we poured testosterone out the window back in the 60s. The male hormones, in other words, have just been discarded. Where is masculinity? But of course, I'm speaking, and J.I. Packer was thinking from the standpoint of God's original idea of what men are supposed to be and do. And I was delighted with that answer of his, that responsibility. Adam was created first. God saw in Adam a need, a special kind of need. It was not good that Adam should be alone. And the first thing in all of God's creative activity, of which he said it was not good, was that Adam was alone. And so then we find God and Adam reviewing all the creatures that God had made as though among them, from the aardvark to the zebra, there might possibly be found a creature adequately designed for the need, to meet the need that God saw in Adam. But there wasn't. And so God in his wisdom created the woman not from the same thing that he created Adam from, which was the dust of the ground. And I was talking to a group of little children in Texas one time, and the teacher was trying to elicit some response from them, and so she said to them, now what did God make Adam out of? And the little boy said, date. And she said, now that's right, that's fine. And and what did he do next? And the little boy said, he blowed sense into him. says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and I thought that was a very good colloquial translation. <laughs> he blowed sense into him. But, and Dr. James Houston, when he's asked if he, think, if he believes in evolution, if in evolution did, God come, did man come from monkeys, his answer is no, much worse. He came from the dust of the ground. But God did not make the woman out of the dust of the ground. He made her out of Adam's bone, as you know, and brought her to Adam. And so she was made for the man, from the man, brought to the man, and named by the man. So we have a very different position in God's economy than men. Much more recently, I was talking with an old friend of mine, old in several ways. He's 80 years old now, and he's just gotten married for the second time about a year ago. And he was just going into raptures about what a wonderful second wife God had given him. He'd been married some 53 years, I think, to the first wife, and she had died, and now he was married again. And I said, when you think of the mystery of Christ and the church as expressed in Ephesians 5, I said, what, what do you think of? That, what do you think Paul had in mind when he said that the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church? And to my amazement, and this man is a very godly man and a very deep Bible student, he said, you know, I've never thought very much about it. And I was sort of taken aback by that. And he said, well, because it just seems so clear to me what it means. I I don't think there could be any doubt about what it means. So I said, well, what does it mean? What does headship mean? Because that's a question that's often asked of me. And he said, protection. 
A husband is meant to protect his wife. Now, I realize that I'm not talking to husbands and wives tonight. I hope I'm talking to potential husbands and wives, some of you, not all of you. But I am talking to men and women, adults. And every one of you men was born with the gift of masculinity. And every one of you women was born with the gift of femininity. Now, what does that mean? I've said that the gift of masculinity is responsibility. The essence of masculinity is responsibility. The essence of femininity is response. He has the responsibility. We are to respond to his responsibility. And we are to be not the initiators, but the responders. And for a husband to love his wife as Christ loved the church means sacrifice. There is no true love without sacrifice. And the modern notion of love is a soupy, feeble, weak sentiment. It's a feeling that you have about somebody. And as I study the meaning of love in scripture, I don't find a syllable about feelings. It's about obedience. And it's about sacrifice. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That is what a husband is meant to do. And when I hear women complaining about Paul being a male chauvinist pig, I say, there's a woman that's never really studied the writings of Paul, because if, if Paul was tough on women, he was much tougher on men. Which is easier, to submit or to take all that responsibility, that awesome, overwhelming responsibility to love his wife as Christ loved the church? It's a lifetime commitment. And the only reason that there are divorces is because people don't recognize the fact that this is an indissoluble bond, that divorce is quite literally impossible in God's sight. Adultery is impossible. It is the dissolving of an indissoluble bond. And the reason that the ancient fathers wrote the vows that they wrote was a very earthy, practical recognition of the fact that feelings will never last in a marriage. They are not a foundation. And so they insisted that people stand up before God and witnesses in public and say, I, Joe, take thee, Sally, to be my wedded wife, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, for better or for worse, as long as we both shall live, till death us do part. This is a vow. This is not a description of a feeling. And so when things get poorer and sicker and worse, it's not negotiable. You don't put it up for grabs every day and say, well, I don't know whether I made a mistake to marry this woman or not. I'm not so sure I feel about her the way I did when we got married. Well, she's changed and I've changed and we've grown apart. Have you ever heard that song before? doesn't work that way. And Eve was created to meet his needs and to bear and to carry and to nurture and to bear children. And the husband was meant to take the responsibility to protect and to provide for his wife and children and to enable her to stay home. And what's happened in modern life? Well, there's hardly any such thing as home. Nobody stays there anymore. And it gets more and more complicated and more and more luxurious and costs more and more money and so it takes two incomes and there's no way that anybody can stay home. And so the parents aren't there and the kids aren't there and God knows where they are. So there's disorder, disharmony, because of equality and feminism. Instead of God's idea of order and harmony and complementarity. Now what does this have to do with singles? We are created with certain standard equipment, aren't we? Each sex representing his responsibility, his or her responsibility to reproduce. And if we are not given the privilege of being husbands and wives and being biological parents, I believe that God expects every single one of us to be spiritual parents. Even if we are biological parents, we are also responsible to be spiritual parents. But every one of us is meant to be a spiritual father or a spiritual mother. 
And I want to read to you a letter from a friend in Australia. She says, she's speaking about her singleness, and this is a, a lovely woman that Lars and I have met, and she just has such a tremendous uh, joy and exuberance about her and a, and a great ministry. And she says, it's true that there are some very lovely, very feminine, very attractive girls who are just passed over. I find that there are a couple of other factors that would add to this. Firstly, the rise of the feminist movement has made many women feel very aggressive and domineering. I've seen men literally run away. I was on the beginning of this in my early 20s, being determined that no man was going to dominate me. I praise the Lord I was rescued from that as I went into Christian ministry and could see how a Christian marriage should and does work. I do believe that the rise in feminism has contributed to the rapid rise of homosexual activity. Men haven't fought for their rights, but have turned to other men. It's more peaceful that way. The only marriageable men around, particularly in Christian circles, are really, and then she puts an ellipsis and says, well, I just couldn't marry them. I try to encourage my friends to be whole people on their own and to allow the Lord to take care of their needs. If they are lonely and empty before marriage, they will continue to be so after. I know many lonely, unhappy marrieds, particularly those who are married who married out of desperation. For myself, I am perfectly content. I have a very full and happy life, and in my singleness I am able to care more for the Lord. I can please myself where I spend my time and with whom I am free to be anti to lots of kids, and I am. And then she tells about some of her concerns, such as not having any financial security, no property, and things like that, that women have a legitimate reason to hope that a man might provide. Then she says, there are times when you'd like someone special, just for you or someone to work with together with a common purpose. But there is nothing perfect this side of heaven, and I just determined to be a part of other couples' lives and their children. I have one family that when I visit, I somehow manage to take over. I bathe the children, read stories, clean teeth, and tuck them into bed. A friend of ours, friend of theirs was visiting one day and noticed me and said to Sue, who's that? How come she just takes over? And Sue said, oh, we love it. When Pam arrives, we don't do a thing with the children, and the kids love the change as well. If only I could talk to some of my friends into doing this as well. Incidentally, I ski with this family for two weeks each year, and I take an equal responsibility with the children, which gives Sue and Greg a break and allows me some mothering as well. Now, that's what I'm talking about. This here is a spiritual mother. I don't mean she's doing just spiritual things. But God has given her a consciousness of her femininity, which she almost lost, as she says, back in her 20s. She is willing to be a bearer, a nurturer, a carrier, a mother of other people's children. And Amy Carmichael, that marvelous Irish missionary who spent 53 years in India, had the opportunity to be married, probably at least twice. And she believed that God had called her to singleness. She didn't know why. Well, in his providence, he ultimately gave her a very remarkable work of rescuing Indian babies from immoral purposes in connection with Hindu temple worship. And at the height of Amy Carmichael's work, back in the 40s, there were 900 in the family, 700 children, and 200 workers. And Amy herself was called Amma, the Tamil word for mother. And she was the mother of all those children. As she said, uh, God had given her a ministry for the first six years of her missionary life in India. She was an itinerant evangelist. And as she was doing this work, she came across this secret underground traffic in babies to the Hindu temples. And she began to pray that God would help her to rescue them. Well, when she did, when God, in remarkable ways, miraculous ways, began to bring these children to her, what happened? She began to try to be a mother and an itinerant evangelist. And finally, the old Tamil proverb got through to her, children tie the mother's feet. And she had to give up this, quote, ministry, this great, visible, successful ministry, and do what here in America today is almost despised, just mothering children. She said, I have cut tens of thousands of tiny little toenails and tiny little fingernails. But she did it for Jesus. She was a spiritual mother. 
which meant a lot of physical work, didn't it? Romans 12 says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. This physical body of bone and muscle and tissue and blood is an act of spiritual worship. That's what one of the translations says. Not just an act of reasonable service, as the King James says, but an act of spiritual worship. And if you ever doubt for a moment that physical work can be spiritual worship, look at Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And it says he did this to show the full extent of his love. And he was giving the disciples an eternal example of something that they could do. Now, wouldn't you think that going to the cross, which is where Jesus was headed at that moment, would be sufficient proof of his love, the full extent of his love? But here he was about to sit down to supper with these 12 <coughs> beloved disciples. And so he said, I have given you this as an example. Do you understand what I've done? If I, your Lord and Master, wash your feet, you must wash one another's feet. You're not all going to have the chance to be crucified. Legend and rumor tells us that some of the disciples were crucified. The Bible doesn't say that, but perhaps they were. But not all of them, and certainly not all of us, get the opportunity to get speared to death or to die some dramatic physical death for Christ's sake. But we can die those little daily deaths of sacrifice for somebody else's sake. Laying down our lives. Now how many men do you know? And I please don't take me as a man, man basher. I am not a man basher at all. My heart goes out to you men, you few over outnumbered men here. I'm sure you feel as though you're just sort of on the gridiron, and I don't mean to do this to you, but I just want to ask the question, have you thought seriously about the fact that love means sacrifice? Maybe you've thought so seriously about it, that's why you're not married. We had a guy who was 30 years old in our freshman class at Wheaton, and of course a 30-year-old man in the freshman class is like, might as well be 90 to us. I mean, he was just doddering. But I can remember saying to him one time, Bill, how come you're not married? And he said, you know, he said, I've been given this business of marriage some serious thought. That's why I'm still single. <laughs> well, maybe that's true of some of you, too. But where are the fathers, the spiritual fathers? Maybe you, didn't, you never had one, you men, and that's why you're still single. You haven't had an older model to copy, to counsel with, somebody to pray with, pray, pray for you. But if you've never had a spiritual mother or a spiritual father, and I've been blessed with both, then let me say to every one of you here tonight, you can be one. If you're 20 years old, you're an older woman. A 15-year-old is looking up to you for an example. I know, I remember when I was 9 years old, my 15-year-old neighbor was my model of womanhood. To me, she was a full-grown woman, and everything she did I wanted to imitate, and I scrutinized. And she was a very lovely Christian girl, and I'm sure had no idea at the time, and could not even imagine that I would be standing up here tonight talking about her as a model to me. But we are meant to be spiritual models. And you men are meant to take responsibility for the world. The world is crying. It's desperate for elders, spiritual fathers, counselors, people who will lay down their lives. And just the other night there was a talk show on the subject of football. And it was a long parade of women who were absolutely furious and up to here with football invading their home life via the television and men who just completely lay aside all family responsibility for the entire weekend and sit in front of the tube. And 
there was a great deal of complaining and yelling and screaming. And then the men were put on the carpet and they were asked to defend their position. And, you know, they were just laid back and said, well, I like it. And if she doesn't like it, that's her problem and et cetera. But to my delight, one man, one young, huge, tall, handsome, blonde, football type with shoulders like this, got up in the audience and he said, I think it's the stupidest thing in the world. The way these men with family responsibilities sit there gazing at a tube for an entire afternoon when they should be out playing with the kids or doing something with their wives. Well, that's one thing that I wish I'd had opportunity to say more often than I have. But I want to ask, how much would you be willing to sacrifice? You're not married men. You don't have family responsibilities. Most, most of you, some of you who are single do have family responsibilities left over from your marriage. So you do know what I'm talking about, I hope, and you take that responsibility seriously. But I'm talking about the things that you that nobody can require of you, such as the letter from Pam that I read you. Nobody's making Pam give up her Saturdays to go over there and help another family to be to them a spiritual mother, an auntie in a way that their mother can't be. And I think of those who have blessed my life by being spiritual mothers to me. They were geographically there in a position where my mother was not at the time. And so they could do for me what I needed to have done. And in Titus, the second chapter, you know, Paul is talking to this young pastor and giving them, giving him advice about the things that he is to teach the people in his church. And in the second chapter, he spe specifically speaks about the, what the old men are to be taught, to be temperate, which means self-controlled, serious, wise. There's far too much foolishness. I mean, when do we grow up? At what age are we considered adults with serious adult responsibility? When are men going to put away childish things the obsession the absolute fixation with sports in America speaks to me very loudly of that escapist refusal of responsibility it's the one thing that men can always talk about it's the one thing which is an excuse that everybody laughs about nobody thinks is very serious and don't go out of here and say Elizabeth Elliot is against sports or says that television watching is wrong. I'm simply saying, can you do that and fulfill your spiritual responsibilities? And Paul's not just talking to married men here. He's talking about older men. Similarly, well, I didn't read all he says about old men. They should be temperate, serious, wise, spiritually healthy through their faith and love and patience. Now, where do you have to exercise your faith and love and patience? How about in the world? And similarly, old women should be reverent in their behavior, should not make unfounded complaints. Or another translation says they shouldn't be gossipers and should not be over fond of wine. They should be examples of the good life so that the younger women may learn to love their husbands and their children, to be sensible and chaste, Home lovers, keepers at home, busy at home. One translation says the older women are to teach the younger women to stay home. Now, can you imagine what kind of popularity I gain for myself by quoting that verse in this day and age? Kind-hearted, willing to adapt themselves to their husbands. One of the reasons there are so many bad marriages is because there are, the older women have not taught the younger women how to love their husbands. Why are the children so uncontrolled in Christian churches? Because nobody, none of the older men have not taught the young fathers how to discipline their children. So I don't know what God is calling you to do specifically about this call, but I do believe that it is a call to all of us. And the Catholic Church, of course, has seen this very clearly throughout the centuries. And millions of Catholics have considered it a high and holy privilege to remain celibate in order to be spiritual fathers and mothers. Think of the blessing to all the world of the nuns and the priests who, who have been holy people, willing to give up 
the joys of home and hearth in order to serve God in this celibate and wholehearted manner. And so I want to give you a passage which applies to every one of us. 2 Corinthians 4. This is an enormously important passage in the scripture. One of my favorites that I go back to again and again trying to plumb the depths. I have Philip's translation here, so I'm not exactly sure what verse this is. Somewhere between verse 7 and verse 15, right about in the middle. He says, every day we experience something of the death of Jesus. So that we may also know the power of the life of Jesus in these bodies of ours. Yes, we who are living are always being exposed to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may be plainly seen in our mortal lives. We are always facing death, but this means that you know more and more of life. As you know the story of the salmon, I'm sure you do, in order for the salmon to reproduce, both the male and the female have to die. After the female has laid the eggs, then the male salmon, who has swum perhaps anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 miles, without eating a thing in that journey from the sea up to the headwaters where, his, where he was born, that male moves over the eggs in that little trough that the female has built and extrudes the sperm-bearing liquid, which is called milt. And those sperms find the egg, and the male dies. And the female then dies. And it is the decomposing bodies of the parents that give life to the newly hatched fingerlings. Did you know that? Life comes out of death. And every time we sit down to the table, that principle is very obvious, isn't it? Practically everything on the table, not the eggs and not the milk and not the butter, but practically everything else represents death, animal or vegetable. Something has had to die in order that I may live. And this is the principle that runs all the way through the scriptures. Jesus said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Amy Carmichael was willing to die to her desire to hold her own baby in her arms and have her own husband in order to give life to what she couldn't imagine was going to be eventually thousands of other people's babies. Now, we do not know the effect in the world to come, the ripple effect that our obedience will have. But you men are meant to be fathers, to be life bearers to the world, to reproduce the life of Christ spiritually in other young men, in younger men, not necessarily younger in age, but younger in experience or spirituality. But this whole picture that Paul has gives us here, I think, is a picture of a pregnant woman. Paul often uses, several times, he uses maternal imagery. He says, I travail in birth. Paul himself says, I travail in birth till Christ be formed in you. He went through agonies and labor for the Galatian Christians that Christ might be formed in them. And he says, oh, my dear children, I have carried you as a nurse in my arms. And the same maternal imagery is used with Moses. He said, I'm so sick of these people. He said, I didn't give them birth, but I have to carry them in my arms like a nursemaid. And he said to God, I'm so tired of them, I wish I could die rather than have to be their mother. Sacrifice is what love is about. Sacrifice is what service is about. And there will be no life without death. And so Paul says, every day we die but not in order to be dead, in order that the life of Jesus may be manifest in this mortal body. We are life bearers. You men, I mentioned the standard equipment with which you are born, it clearly indicates that you are meant to be initiators. And we women, what does the female body represent? It is a chalice, a vessel, 
to be to receive, to bear, to carry, to nurture. And every month a woman is given a reminder of the fact that life comes out of death. The sign of blood is a sign of death. Do, do you ever think of the spiritual implications of these visible realities? Well, I happen to be what you might call a sacramentalist. I see in the visible realities of the, na of the natural world tremendous spiritual truths. And, of course, Jesus gave them to us over and over and over again. He talked about visible, common, tangible things. Bread, stones, wine, st uh, water, the sunlight, the seed, visible signs of invisible realities. Our sexuality is a visible sign of the invisible reality that we are made to be life bearers. And so... Forgetting all the superficial stuff about dating and how to get a man and how to move toward marriage and all the rest of it. If you disagree with everything I said this morning, please go back to this central truth of the cross. We are always facing death, Paul says. But this means that you know more and more of life. I have to lay down my life in order that somebody else may have it. Jesus Christ showed us the principle of the cross, my life for yours. He said, the bread that I will give is my body, and I give it for the life of the world. Are you prepared to be broken bread and poured out wine? I'm told that when Mother Teresa trains the novices and the probationers, or whatever they call them, <coughs> women who come to try to serve with her, that one of the things she tells them is, the people will eat you up. And we could not do this without partaking. Every morning at 4 o'clock, I understand, the Sisters of Charity partake of the bread and the wine. In order to be broken bread, to give out this life to the world, we have to be filling ourselves with that spiritual food of the life of Christ himself. And so Paul gives us this tremendous passage. He says, This priceless treasure we hold, so to speak, in a common earthenware jar. Here, here's this vessel, this chalice idea again. To show that the splendid power of it belongs to God and not to us. I don't have anything that I didn't receive. And whenever anybody gives me a compliment about a talk or a book or whatever, really all I can say, I mean, I can say thank you because you're kind to say something like that, but I don't have anything that I haven't received. Paul says, the splendid power belongs to God, not to us. We are handicapped on all sides, but we are never frustrated. We are puzzled, but never in despair. We are persecuted, but we never have to stand it alone. We may be knocked down, but we are never knocked out. Every day we experience something of the death of Jesus. And I said earlier that in my book on suffering, I've tried to give a comprehensive definition of, of suffering. It's, it's these little it, deaths. Some of them are, most of them are little, some of them are big. But we die a thousand deaths, don't we? Paul says, I die daily. Every day we experience something of the death of Jesus, but there's always a reason. So that we may also know the power of the life of Jesus in these bodies of ours. Yes, we who are living are always being exposed to death for Jesus' sake. Love means sacrifice. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul sitting glued in front of a tube throughout the World Series or the NFL playoffs or whatever? I mean, really, try to imagine that. When you, when you say, well, there's nothing wrong with this, what I want to say is, okay, put, your, put the apostles or put Jesus in the position and see how ludicrous it looks. You know, even put your own father. I try to imagine my own father that I think of, a man with tremendous simplicity and godliness and dignity. And he was wonderful getting down on his hands and knees and riding us children around as if he were a horse and letting us ride on his size 12 shoes and things like that. 
you know, he played, he did know how to play, and he loved outdoor, the outdoors and hiking and swimming and things. But as for going off by himself or with, quote, the boys on a Saturday afternoon, never once did that ever happen. His Saturday afternoons were given to his children. We could count on that. My father was home. So you're single. You don't have children. Think about the ways in which you may be a life bearer, perhaps to somebody else's little children or to some young, lonely, single person who's much worse off than you are, knows much less of the power of the life of Jesus. On the wall of my study, I have four lines that come from a man named Ugo Bassi. This is what it says. It's, it's in the context, these four lines come in the, in the context of a sermon that he preached on John 15, the pouring out of the life of the vine. And the vine has to be cut back and pruned and tied to a stake in order to produce the beautiful fruit which becomes wine. So that's the context. And these are the four lines. Measure thy life by loss and not by gain. Not by the wine drunk, but by the wine poured forth. For love's strength standeth in love's sacrifice. And he that suffereth most hath most to give. We are life bearers. Do you think of singleness as a problem? Or do you think of it as a gift? It is a gift. 1 Corinthians 7 clearly tells us that our marital status, whether marriage or singleness, is a gift. And it is within the context of this gift that God wants you and me to be life bearers. May God give us the grace and the desire and the joy of being cooperators with him in this holy harmony. God bless you. I pray you've been encouraged and inspired by what you've heard today. And will keep joining us here and on social media for my granny's inspiration. Until then, remember, the eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms.